So I believe this is where we left off last time. What does it mean to be born again? Or somewhere hereabouts, mm -hmm. session six. So I think I brought this up last time, but how would you answer that question? What does it mean to be born again? Somebody asks you, one of your family members shows up at your house. It's Christmas, the whole family's in, you haven't seen them in a while. That unbelieving cousin says, well, what? I just don't get this whole born again thing. What does it mean to be born again? What would you say? How would you answer that? You shed your old self and become a new person. Okay. There's this idea of, of newness. Good. Anything else? Yes. That you have to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins and confess with your mouth. Okay, there's that, that uh, evidence that shows the, um, the new life in Christ. Good. I think having the Holy Spirit. Okay, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Yep, all evidences of, of being born again. Good. Any other thoughts? And it's also about restored relationship. What was broken in the garden being restored again and being born again. So the death is that separation and then this this new relationship is awakened and, and brought in. So come on in, come on in. So then let's uh, continue talking about born, being born again. And this is in this section of calling and regeneration. We talked about calling last time. That there's, uh, there's two, does anybody remember the two kinds of calls? Man, I'd be impressed. General uh -huh. and specific. You, I, we'll go with that. Yes. Yeah. If I think we call it effectual, but specific works too. I think it's it goes by either. Yeah, there's a general call that goes out to people, but then there's a, a, a different kind of a call because there's a call that the uh, those who will believe will respond to. Um, a specific call or an effectual call. So we're doing this calling regeneration right now. The call goes out. Um, God issues it. However, it comes through the preaching of the word, the pastor, uh, whomever is sharing the gospel. And then there's this act of regeneration. And you, we can define it as the act whereby God awakens or regenerates the dead per spirit of a person, restoring the ability to respond to and have a relationship with him. <laughs> Now, not everybody would agree with this. There's actually an assumption in this definition of regeneration. Uh, and I'll get into that in just a minute. So we see this, John 3, 1 through 8. Uh, I'm going to skip down to Jesus answered and said to him. Who, he's talking to Nicodemus. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, I know I didn't read the whole passage, but who is it that needs to be born again? Everyone. Everyone, yeah. Everyone has to go through this, this regeneration, this being born again. Is that true of just those in the New Testament? Or is that true of those in the Old Testament as well? Well, what about the thief on the cross? Was it necessarily born again? Was it? Well, look, it's a good question. Was the thief on the cross born again? Well, notice if you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. It's the very beginning of the understanding there is a kingdom of God, that there is some uh, set of rules, a set of governance that goes beyond what you thought was there. Okay. So did the thief on the cross see the kingdom of God? I think so. So then that would generate, but Old Testament? Yeah, I would, like, 
Abraham is still the father of faith. He's not the father of the Jews. He's called the father of faith. Is your remember the song? Father My Abraham has made sense. Oh yeah. yeah. Right arm, them. left and arm, so right foot. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I won't do all the motions. <laughs> right. We all became children of Abraham, right? Good. Okay. Who would say that in the Old Testament you had to be born again? I think that everybody that meet everybody that has to have faith, and whether that faith comes at a snap or a long time, yeah, it has to happen. Whether it's the Old, Old Testament or New Testament, you have to believe in God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once you once you do that, it's it's done. I believe there. Yeah, you were going to say something. I'm just going to say like the thief on the cross. Yeah, we have a few words that were there, but God knew His heart. God knew His intentions. He knew what He was, you know, asking. Yeah. yeah. Just like that. Yep. Yeah, I think that he was born again. I believe he would have had to have been in order to, in order to believe, right? I, I think that this is, and, and where we're putting this in the order of salvation, this would have to, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but this would have to precede believing. What do you think about it? What do you think about that one? Did you don't this think would... they happen simultaneously? Let's keep going. Okay. Let's keep moving forward. You're asking the right question. It's an ex... You're asking the right question here. So listen to this. This is a quote from Bruce Demarest. The spiritual condition of pre-Christians is grave. Superficial remedies cannot redress such a cluster of problems. The only hope lies in a radical spiritual solution. What once born people need is supernatural transformation of their lives by the power of God. This transformation the Bible calls regeneration or new birth. So this would be the ability to now, and it's it's different from prevenient grace. You know, we talked about that in the Arminian position, but this would be the supernatural enabling of the believer to believe. That's what regeneration would be. If, if we are dead, if we are corpses out there, you know, that's uh, then how does a how does a dead body then how does a dead person then proceed to choose God to make a choice? Let's keep going. Here's the question. Does regeneration precede, this really kind of gets to the heart of the issue, does regeneration precede faith? Now it seems like, it, it really kind of seems like it would have to. Um, and otherwise you're trying to explain, well, how does someone turn to the gospel on their own? Experientially, we talked about, that sure is what it seemed like to me. I mean, this is what we've been talking about all along. Is you know when I became a Christian, everything in my experience was telling me this was a choice I was making. But then we start hitting those New Testament passages, and it sure seems like something uh, happened before I ever made a move toward God. So, hang on to that thought. Does regeneration precede faith? Um, there's this idea of monogistic regeneration that means it's all God, that God and God alone is responsible for, uh, you could say, bearing you again, or you being born again, or you being regenerate. That's the reform position. Now, it's different in the Arminian view. You know, that the regeneration is a cooperative act between God and man. Because in the Arminian view, remember, you would have already received, at the very get-go, uh, by means of that provenient grace, I've, I've called before that, that pixie dust grace that God just sprinkles out on everyone. Everybody's got a 50-50 shot, and, and God chooses those who he knows would choose him. That's the Arminian position. Therefore, it stands to reason that it's a cooperative act because by my own will, I chose God. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. I'm going to keep moving here. So what is the evidence that regeneration would come before faith or that, you know, before we believe? There's a lot of passages that, that really point to this. Uh, why don't we read, is there one? 
So let me read this one since I got it in the notes. Okay, unless we've we've touched on this before. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But... This is two key words. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved. So there is that idea of that. It was an act of God. You know, we were all just like everybody else. You know, all these ways of describing the the unbeliever, you know, walking, just walking along in the course of this world, just like every other unbeliever does, until God made us alive. And that's, again, we've talked about that great theological movie, The Princess Bride. You know, he, how dead is this guy? Is he all the way dead, or just sort of dead, or is he completely dead? How dead are we? Well, yeah, it says we're dead. Then 1 Peter 1 3, blessed. Be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now don't forget, you know, Second uh, Peter's also where um, where the scriptures tell us that God desires for all to be saved. Right? Same author who who made that statement is, is also saying, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then First Peter one twenty three, since you have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. So just in these passages, I mean, does it convey the idea that uh, is God is the one doing all the work in regeneration, or does it seem, how would you describe it just based on what we're reading? We can... We can discuss. It, it's just the language. As hard as it is, and as as much as it's beyond me to understand it, when I read the plain language of the Bible, it sure does seem like God is the one uh, doing the work. You know. Um, I don't think that as sinners we would even be looking for God if God didn't in somehow intersect. So yeah. Yeah. It takes something. It takes something outside of us. It took someone outside of us. And I... Yes, ma'am. I think about... Crunching the mark. Um, like when some of the Sadducees and the Pharisees like just didn't get it they weren't catching on when when jesus was here on earth and then others it was as plain as day that he was the messiah but and, and so it almost seems like some some eyes were open some eyes were closed or hearts hardened or however you want to yeah. say it but it just seems like the same <clears throat> things were being said so it it does seem like he either opens your eyes or or doesn't yeah, yeah, it's, it's all, you know, in John 6, and that's where, to me, it's so important to get those passages where, you know, we talk about the idea of compatibilism, that uh, that it's both God and man, in that it's, and it's 100%, 100%, 100% God's sovereign movement, and 100% our responsibility such that if anyone is unsaved, they are the ones held 100% responsible for that. And I, you know, that's where I have to, again, suspend my logic to say, well, how, because we, remember we talked about double predestination. Does God predestine, if he predestines some to heaven, doesn't it stand to reason that he predestines some to hell? And yet I don't see anything in the scripture that would indicate that that's the case. I can logic logically that's what makes sense to me, and it, I, it's 
I mean, to say it, it's hard to accept that as an understatement, but at the same time, there's uh, the explicit, to me, the explicit word of God is that he, that, that's not how it works. It's the same way, you know, we talked about limited versus unlimited atonement. Logic would tell me, I mean, I could see the possibility of God uh, only dying for the elect or the saved. However, Scripture seems to say, say something different. You know, I think it's, again, the plain reading of the text would say that God died for everyone. Not just those who will be saved. So does that kind of go with the um, the sower of the seeds? Like we're all seeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then some doesn't grow, some is shallow, and then some is in good earth. It, yeah. And, and even in those, so even when you read the parable of the sower, right? So the gospel, the seed is the gospel going out. Mm -hmm. It lands here. It lands there. I mean, isn't there a sense of the soil bearing some responsibility as to you know what? What will will or won't grow? It has there. to be good soil. It has to be good soil. It's got to be. Is that, is that the word then? No. That'll be the word. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just a thought, I guess, is I mean, uh, as beings that God created, when He planted something in us, to always be searching for Him, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so we do, and then people that go astray, they're still searching for something. They just missing them. Missing the mark. Yeah, um, yeah, the, you know, the God-shaped hole, right? The, the. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of a, a verse that would. Lots of people have written really cool, kind of poetic things about that. I just can't think of a verse off the top of my head that, that goes to what you're saying. Um, and yet, some uh, will will not put their trust in him you know even though it, it's sad it's sad how how evident i think it is that there has to be a god and i was listening to somebody of an atheist talking yesterday he's a brilliant guy named eric weinstein he's a professor at harvard and um physicist and yet he calls himself an, an atheist i'm thinking how much faith does it take to be an atheist you know, with all the evidence, especially someone that knows the universe like he does. Yeah. So yeah. So that is the word. It's, it's the gospel. So the seed would be the gospel going out, and then some places it takes root, some place places it doesn't, depending on the soil. So what is good news to a dead man as light cannot restore sight to a blind man, so the light of the gospel cannot give spiritual light to one who is spiritually blind. So God has to un give us sight, has to unblind us. John 1.13, um, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Just speaking to those that uh, to whom God invaded their deadness, uh, their spirit restored it. Um, And, and you know, we believe we believe to the degree uh, that we are sort of capable of of believing. And, and let me ask: How much faith does it take to uh, become a Christian? Like, how much? Mustard. Yeah. <laughs> I had a lady whenever I was working. By the way, when you work for a seminary, you get all kinds of phone calls. You get wild phone calls. And they were fun. I mean, I really enjoyed it. They, they would typically funnel these people to me when I was working there. And we had a lady that called in, and I'll never forget this. She said, okay. She said, well, I'm trying to figure out if I'm a Christian. I said, okay, let's figure it out. And she said, I just started asking, let me just ask you some questions. Well, tell me what you believe. Well, I believe that Jesus died for me. Okay, well, that's a great start. Okay. Do you understand your sin? Yes, basically the baptism questions. Do you understand your sinner? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, good. Do you know who Jesus says? Yeah, I believe he's God, and, and he died for me. I said, okay, that's good. I said, and do, you, do you trust that? Do you believe that? She said, yeah, but she said, how much do I have to trust that? I thought, here's her problem. She's got some fear of, is it enough? And that's when I said, do you know what? I said, however you measure faith, however it is, whatever the absolute smallest amount 
is that you can measure. I said, that is all it takes. Just the tiniest, you know, Jesus chose the tiniest seed to, to measure that out. I said, that's it. And that, that, was, that was a fun phone call because she seemed like she got it. But it's just, yeah, it's just this tiny little bit. And, and not everyone, um, when they come to faith, goes through a big radical change either. Yeah, I think especially, now there's some of you here who just kind of grew up in church and maybe you don't even honestly remember when uh, you didn't believe in God. Like, I, yeah, I, it's kind of, I, you know, I love, my wife has a really cool testimony. She trusted Christ in her uh, early 20s and it was a dramatic uh, change. I mean, you know, she was an adult and it, uh, she went to an Easter uh, uh, passion play, and she saw the whole thing play out. She trusted Christ, that it came back the next week, got baptized, and you know, for me, it was just like I don't really remember not believing. I mean, I just kind of grew up in church, and so not everybody goes through a huge radical transformation. Some people do. It just depends on when you hear that message. So, yeah. So being born again can be a radical change but it may not it it's different for every person a different experience um the natural but a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of god for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised but he was spiritual praises all things yet he himself is appraised by no one so you know again why must regeneration precede faith because in our natural state, we don't accept um, the things of the Spirit of God. And again, this flies in the face of experience. Because my experience tells me one thing, but I come to scriptures like, wow, it really did take a miracle for me to become a Christian. So any other comments about that? Questions? Is this like is this um, new to you all, or is this kind of like things you already had heard? Like, is this a struggle, or or no? It's a yeah, struggle. struggle. The tension, the tension, tension. Is a struggle for me to. Like I said, I keep going back to a God that is not this amazing. It's not worth. Following or one you can just put the box absolutely completely. So that's how I reconcile this whole thing because it's just there's too much tension. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't think I ever put born again. Like I always just kind of synonymously got saved at the same time. Yeah. I never put it as like the step before. And I think you know, like like you said, experience my own personal experience. I feel like I chose the Lord. But walking along with raising my children and, and other people that you're ministering to, you can tell when God starts to quicken them. It's something you can't explain. You've been saying the same stuff for years, and suddenly they just want it, crave it, need it, got to get it. Mm. And that quickening, I think, is that kind of like, I don't know, I guess the way I reconcile it in my own head is God calls all of us at some point in our life. Now, whether we choose to be Samson and live in total rebellion of our calling, or whether we choose to just totally Rahab and jump out the window and say, let's do this. Yeah. But he calls us all because he loves us all. And it says he died for us all. Like I, I can't accept the fact that he doesn't try every single person and, and crave every single soul. But at the same time, he's a gentleman and says, free will is important. It's my greatest gift to mankind, and I'm going to let you choose to not spend eternity with me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, my wife just had a conversation with a family member of hers this past week. Mm -hmm. and, um, and her comment was, the reason I'm having such a hard time with Christianity is because how can a good God not allow everybody to hear the gospel and and come to faith? 
And, and I think at some point, if you don't struggle through that, I think we all should struggle through that at some point. Yes? I believe that he does. It's your choice not to. Yeah. And I believe every second, every minute, God is in each one giving them something. And that they either accept it and start looking at his word, start doing things that he's asking you to do, or you ignore it. Mm -hmm. I think that happens to everyone every second of the world. I mean, maybe that's a weird way of thinking about it. But. Well, I, but there are some people who won't like who won't hear the gospel. Like there are people who even generation after generation, like there are still people groups in the world that are just now two thousand years into this Christianity thing, just now getting the gospel. True, but they were probably searching for something all along anyway. And I think that's what God puts in them is to be searching. Yeah. Until yeah. they hear the right thing and accept the right thing. Well, yeah. Romans addresses that. Yeah. Like the book of Romans is very clear about those who have heard the gospel and the expectations God has of them and the accountability He holds in them. Mm -hmm. And then the expectation He holds to those with the law written on their hearts. Like we instinctively know a certain level of God's revelation. Mm -hmm. Now we may not have heard the name Jesus. But the Lord holds us accountable to what we know, however much or little that is. And even I, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm showing my cards here. I, and I think that I, if I was in that conversation, I would have said, you know, and God always can send a missionary, right? And he's uh, just. If he's, I mean, the ones that he has are going to believe and they're going to put their faith in him, um, right? That's what Christ said. At, no one can snatch them out of my hand. You know, those whom the Father has given me, given me. So, and when you, when you look at Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, to me that's the classic example of if someone is going to put their faith in Christ, then it's not a problem for God to send someone to them. And you know, if He can sort of zap Philip right there to be with the Ethiopian eunuch, however that went down, all of a sudden he was just carried there. Um, he can always bring someone to to someone to hear the gospel. Okay, let's keep moving. Slip sliding towards the whole predestination there. <laughs> how, how so? Well, you know, when you start saying, well, somebody who's going to be there, God could send the missionary, so then since they're not going to be somebody there, God's not going to send the message there, so, hey, there a little bit. It's it's uh, again logically, I could, I would arrive at double predestination. However, biblically, I don't see it. It's like I, and I can't, I, I can't even put all the pieces totally together. Like, yeah, yeah, good. Any other questions? Okay. But it took me a bit, but you were asking about those who haven't heard? Yes. But it is Romans 2, 14 and 15. Let right. me read it real quick. Sure. Uh, for when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves. In that, they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to the to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ. So it's written on their hearts, even though they haven't heard. It's already written on us. So. Then going on to verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day, when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Um, yeah, so, you know, is this saying that... Is, is this a law about conscience and the conscience of every person or is this a verse about 
um, by virtue of just being aware that you're doing something wrong that is sufficient for salvation. You see what I mean? And I, I believe, I still believe, if, if, we, um, if we try to explain a salvation that's provided outside of someone hearing and believing the gospel, I, I think it's hard to get there biblically. Like, I think a... And that's why I was talking about the missionary, like, even that story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. I think the gospel is needed. Even with Muslims, you know, there's a lot of Muslims that are coming to faith by means of a vision. However, the vision is seems to be a means of drawing them towards hearing the gospel. That's the general call. A general call, yeah. yeah. Well, and maybe not even... I was even hearing today about the idea of a progressive call. Like, yeah, you know what? It, it would be part of the call. It would be what got them to the gospel. It's what got them to Jesus, you know? Um, I heard one testimony of a Muslim. They were in a, a mosque, and all of a sudden they said that they saw like a vision of light streaming down the walls or, or something. But what it did, he said, I knew that I needed to get a Bible. I'll never forget this guy saying this. Like, I knew I needed to get my hands on a Bible. In other words, the, the vision drew them closer in. However, it was not yet sufficient to save. Does that make sense? You know, there was still, still everything we're talking about here. There was, and, and, you know, was that regeneration? I don't know. I don't know. Something, it was something that drew them and brought them along the process. So one other, there's another um, slide here. The Bible presents the case that people in their natural state are evil, Jeremiah 17, 9, don't ever seek God, Romans 3, 10, 11, cannot understand or accept spiritual things, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, spiritually dead, Ephesians 2, 1, cannot change their position, so how can anyone expect them in their natural state to do the greatest good and accept the gospel? If all these things are true about the individual, what in them would make them uh, make a move towards God? Now again, like if this, it, I think you can read the Bible starting at Genesis and get all the way up to the beginning of the New Testament and think people by their own will were choosing God, choosing to do. And that's what our experience tells us. It's not until we get to these passages that we start seeing in Paul's epistles, in the, in the Gospel of John, that it starts calling into question, oh, wait a minute. It wasn't as much me as I thought it was. Choosing God, oh, wait a minute. Uh, it was a miracle that I would even have uh, walk down that aisle. And you know, not every kid in their class that I was in threw their hand up to accept Jesus uh, at vacation Bible school. So, any questions on this? You know, the idea the leper can't change her spots? Chad? Yes. I have a thought on that. That, that I think it's a maturing of Christians to realize that we're God. I, that, because, I agree 100%. Okay. I agree a hundred percent. I don't think I don't think a single one of us. Well, we'll speak for anybody else. <laughs> I know that I never. Um, when I became a Christian, if someone would have said, "Oh, look who God chose," well, that wouldn't have really made sense to me at all. What, what do you mean that God? I, I chose this. I, I I'm standing here. Um, I don't think any of us would have, again, I'll just speak for me, I don't think that's natural to think that way. When, you know, something totally against your experience. Anybody else? Yeah, I definitely think it's, I mean, yeah, I think it's just, if, if the Word of God wasn't explicit in telling us this, we wouldn't, it would never occur to us. That we that God also chose us. It's like I, you know I think I mentioned before. It's like we walk through a doorway and over it says, 
I'm choosing God. You go through the doorway and you look backwards and over it it says, I chose you. That's the kind of the best sense I can make. My experience versus what God's doing. Um, okay, so we'll close with this uh, this session, with this uh, verse, talking about Lydia, Acts 16, 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and then, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken uh, by Paul. Again, you know, it says she was a worshiper, but it's um, that was a term used for Gentiles who were following um, God around, following the disciples around. Uh, and, and yet it was God who did the work to open her heart to believe. Any other questions about calling and regeneration before we move on to faith and repentance? Okay. Is anybody really disturbed out there? Is anybody... We can pause and pray. <laughs> we need to pause and pray. Okay. Let's go to session seven. I think it just takes time to chew on it for a while. Oh, yeah. Okay. So then, how we, we really are getting to the crux of the matter, how is a person saved? We've been talking about the big topics, um, predestination, being chosen, uh, but then how is the atonement applied to our lives? And it's important that we look at some of the difficulties that surround the ideas of faith and repentance. Um, and, and I am increasingly becoming comfortable with the tensions in Scripture. You know, you, Rachel talked about living in those tensions that come up. And there are just tensions that we have to learn to live in because we are not going to fully understand everything that God does. Uh, sometimes I, I wish, God, I wish you'd have told us more. But then I'm like, yeah, I really don't even get everything that we've got so far. I don't know that more information is, he knows what we needed. So let's go through um, faith and repentance now, because this really is, we're getting to what we are commanded to do, what we're responsible for. So this would fall in, you know, we're looking at this order of salvation and this doctrine of conversion. So notice in our timeline, now we're getting into a God-man section. So even... Uh, in the, in the Reformed position, um, there would be this sense of this is not just God involved now in the process. This is we're getting into our responsibilities uh, in the order of salvation. So the question that we need to struggle through with is can you have faith without repentance? Or can you have repentance without faith? Can you have one without the other? Any thoughts? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? That's what we're going to delve into here. But I don't think you can have repentance without an action that supports what you've done. I mean, I think your life will change. I think you'll make different decisions. You'll do things differently. You'll respect people. You know, it comes up a lot when you start talking about salvation is this idea of repentance. And some people will really go after, well, you have got to repent before you can be saved, you know. And it's not, I mean, there's a biblical reason for this. So Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, who was it that said this? John the Baptist. Okay. It was John the Baptist. What was the gospel to John the Baptist? That the kingdom of God was coming. Okay. Is it different than what we would say the gospel is? Do you think he fully got what the program was about to be? 
wasn't he there to kind of prepare the way? Yes. I mean, yes. He wasn't it, but he was trying to prepare for Jesus. Yep, yep. That was his, um, that's what he was born to do. Uh, so for, for him, you know, the gospel at this point is, um, it is repentance. It is about repenting of your sin. And, uh, you know, we know what John the Baptist doesn't. That's going to be death, burial, and resurrection. Whereas he's emphasizing um, the good news about the repentance of sin, repentance and belief. Now, the, the repentance of something is, is what's going to be debated. So the question, let's, we'll walk through faith and repentance. First of all, what does it mean to have faith? It's this Greek word, pistuo. Believe, have faith, and have confidence in someone or something and entrust something to another. So to believe and have faith, to have confidence in someone or something, because there's, a, there's a, a content there, and then to entrust something to another. So when the reformers were thinking about what is faith, okay, so this has been around 1500, they came with the definition that there were these three elements of faith. The, the notitia that you had to have knowledge there was assent, and then there was this idea of trust. So when they're asking the question, what does it mean to have faith? First of all, they said, well, there had to be this, this knowledge. There had to be a, uh, they had to have con content. Now, usually when we think of faith, we don't, we don't always, we think of it as uh, the lack of knowledge. In other words, I don't know this, therefore, uh, I just believe this. I just trust this. Um, so faith kind of makes up for what knowledge is lacking. I just, you know, you may call it a, a blind faith or, or blind trust. Uh, and then you know, the less knowledge, well, the greater the leap. You know, the greater the faith. But that isn't necessarily what they're um, talking about. You know, as a matter of fact, if, if, you, if you were to take faith and just um, call it some kind of an inner feeling, well, I just feel that I trust this. You know, I just feel that I believe this. Yet you know, when you do that, you're really just leveling the playing field for every religion out there. In other words, if, if faith is just an inner subjective feeling, then you really can't pit one religion as being better than another. Does that make sense? Because a, a Muslim would say could say the same thing. A Mormon could say the same thing. Um, as a matter of fact, if you if you ever talk to a Mormon and you ask them, uh, and, and I think this is the right story. I haven't done this, but if you were just to ask him, tell me tell me why you believe what you believe. Just tell me you know, why is it that you are in this, this faith. And there is a verse I, in their Book of Mormon that says, if you just sort of take this blindly, then you'll receive an assurance. Uh, it's written there in their Book of Mormon that if you just believe, then, then you'll be sort of enabled to trust if you take that initial step. But do you see, already see the circular problem with that, that you already have to trust what the book is saying if you're going to believe what the book says about belief. So there's a problem there. And if that's all we're going to do, then again, it sort of levels the playing field of every faith out there, every religion out there, every God out there. So it had, the, the reformers then had a different idea um, of, of what faith was. They said it had to have this this knowledge, in other words, they had to have this basis for our faith, this content. Um, you had to have a knowledge of something. You had to know what you were believing in. Um, I've, I don't know if you've ever heard the lifeboat analogy before. I'm going to kind of use this as we walk through this. If you're in a sinking ship and there's a lifeboat, 
and, and you want to save your life. There's a few things you have to do in order to do that. First of all, you have to know that that is a lifeboat. In other words, if it was just a toaster hanging off the side of the boat, and you looked at it and said, I'm going to, I know I'm being silly, I'm being facetious for the sake of illustration. And you look at that toaster, it, you, know, you can have all the faith in that world in that toaster, but is that toaster able to save you? So you got to, so you have to believe, okay, there's a ship there, there's a boat there, and I understand what that is. So that is, you have to have this knowledge of what you are putting your faith in. And that's, that's, that's one of the reasons we do theology, by the way, is we are asking the question, okay, I'm a Christian. I've always said I'm a Christian. What exactly in the world does it mean when I say I am a Christian? Well, what makes you a Christian is that in which you've placed your faith. So we're, we're gaining this knowledge. Okay, here is what, this is the content of the faith of the Christian. So, again, these uh, reformers, you had to have a knowledge of what it was you were putting your faith in. You had to know something. Because you could say, well, I, I believe in Jesus. Well, who else in the Bible says they believe in Jesus? The demons. The demons, yeah. If you just say, well, I believe in Jesus, okay, well, you've got the faith of a demon. <laughs> they believe in Jesus. And then it, there's another step, and that is um, assent. So uh, this is the aspect that um, this is an understanding and an agreement uh, with what the uh, knowledge purports. So in other words, if we get back to the lifeboat, okay, I recognize that as a boat. That is a boat that someone should be able to get inside and float in. But then there's an ascent. There is an ascent that I know what it is and I, I, believe I can get in it. Does that make that would be the like step two is that is a lifeboat and that is a lifeboat that could save me. Are we good there? Okay. And then trust. Um did I have something else to say about the set? Okay, yeah, well here's another example before I go on to trust. So um, Thomas uh, would be an example of one who needed assent before he, or the ascent, as it's saying here. Yeah, what separated Thomas from the other disciples? He was a doubter. He was like, okay, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. However, I need more than that. Do you ever wonder if he's just the only one that said that, though? It's the only one we have a record of. Right. Yeah, yeah. So... Jesus, does Jesus argue with Thomas about, does he ever condemn Thomas for having such little pathetic faith? What does he do? What does he allow Thomas to do? Be convinced. Yeah, he said, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Thomas. Just put your hand right in my, put it in the spear hole. Um, so this is the, the evidence. Um, you know, he said, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and, and put my finger in the place of the nails, I, I won't believe. So it's important, and Christ didn't rebuke him for that. And the danger in not having this aspect of the faith is that we're trying to, it's like we're trying to neglect our own rationality. So, so what, did Jesus, did, what did Jesus do to prove that he was re resurrected from the dead? Did he just poof right out of the, the tomb and just go straight to heaven? He appeared to more than 500 people. So it would not be irrational to witness the death of Christ and then see the, the, resurrect, the resurrected Jesus uh, because he provided the evidence. See, this is why we don't have an irrational faith. Uh, faith is not irrational. We're made as rational creatures. Um, and then even, uh, so Hebrews 11.1 1 speaks of the ascent inherent in the faith. Uh, and then um, 
in Exodus 4, Moses, when he asked how the people are going to believe that God had sent him, uh, God didn't say, no, they just have to have faith. They just, no, they, God didn't say that. Um, he gives him a bunch of signs that would evidence God's presence with Moses. You know, there was um, what happened with the, uh, in, in, in Pharaoh's court, right? The, 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 the staff turning into a snake. Then there's all the signs, the river turning to blood. I mean, there's all those signs that accompanied what Moses did. So there is this sense of God is providing the evidence of belief. Okay? A census. So that is this rational appeal to the evidence. And then last, trust. Um, so without this, faith is not complete. So uh, James 2.19, um, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and, and shudder. You know, this is okay. This is um, getting in the lifeboat. I know what it is. I believe in, I've seen lifeboats before. I have reason to believe it'll hold me up and I'm going to get in the lifeboat. I'm trusting what Jesus did. And as that trust increases, what would we expect in our own life as our trust in Christ increases? He started calling other people. Faith increases. What's that? You start calling other people to get in the boat. You start calling other people to get in the boat? I heard a really interesting... You know the, the um, comedian's Penn and Teller? Um, the big guy, Penn, I think is, is who that is. I just heard something... Uh, he I don't know when he recorded this. He claims to be an atheist, but he said, you know what? He said, I have no respect for Christians who are not out there proselytizing what they believe. He said, if I saw that a truck was about to run you over, he said, I would try to tackle you to get out of the way. And what you all are sharing is way more important than getting hit by a truck. Man, that was convicting. If you think that he's saying, if you think I'm going to die and go to hell, why aren't you telling me how I can not go to hell? Is, is what he was saying. It's fascinating. We would expect our evangelism to increase, we would expect our fears to become less and less, or our fear of death to become less and less. Any other comments on that one? Questions? Anything not clear? But that word appears to be the root of fiducia. Yeah, yeah. Which is a position of trust. I find out how good my fiduciary is here in about 20 years or so. Won't I? My retirement plan is to retire at 70 and die about 70 and a half. That's, that's the plan. Good six months there. Okay, what does it mean to repent? Uh, the Greek word is metanaeo. I think I'm saying that right. To change one's thinking and way of life as a result of a change of attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. So it's, you know, some the, the Hebrew word is shuv. It's that you would turn. You're going in one direction and you turn and you start going in a different direction. It's a change. Uh, Acts 2, 27 to 38. I said, yeah. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent! And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter is making a big deal out of repentance here. As a matter of fact, that was the command. What do I do? Um, this is a response to hearing the message. And uh, do you see, what, what don't you see in this passage? Believe. Okay. You don't see it there, do you? Well, it's assumed because they're pierced to the heart. Because the thing is, if you believe what God says is true, it is going to bring you to repentance. Okay. I think that's really, that gets to the heart of the matter. There's an assumption of faith here, isn't there? Good. Yeah, there's, uh, it should be a natural outcome of faith. You know, when they're saying, what shall we do? 
these, those who are pierced to the heart, they are showing signs of faith. And now Peter's saying, repent. Okay, good. Acts 3.19, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And in the New Testament, you know, it's, it's important to understand they don't separate um, how we act and how we believe. Like in, in the New Testament mindset, there was no difference. Like how you acted indicated uh, what it was that you believed. So, you know, for them to be talking about, uh, does that make you uneasy, by the way? That acting and believing is that because it's kind of getting to works. So they 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 would not have separated um, belief and works probably the same way we do. Yeah, you know, that was a big mark of the Reformation because a line had to be laid down because there was a a belief in salvation by works. So the reformers worked hard to tear those two things apart from each other. Probably more so than the New Testament may have torn the two apart because again for them. One was indicative of the other. That's why we struggle so much with James. That's why uh, Luther was going to take uh, the book of James out of the Bible because of what he said about faith without works is dead. Whoa. We're working really hard not to let that back into the system here. Okay, but we're getting closer to a debate with this repentance and faith thing. Uh, Matthew uh, 3, 1 and 2. Then 5 through 8, Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then, Jer then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance." So again, the emphasis is placed on repenting. And you really, do you see anything about belief in there? But isn't this like, in the context of this, because the New Testament was such a different program from the Old Testament, wasn't there like such a separation that you either like, believed it or you didn't and it was so black and white at that point that you either lived it or you didn't so it was sort of not like today where our works are I don't know it's not as black or white is that does that make sense what yeah so you're just saying it was a clear dividing line <clears throat> at that time like yeah. you were either in it or you weren't yeah and like you didn't have the option to not right Maybe, yeah, perhaps. I don't know, though. I, I think that there were still, as Jesus even was, was um, continuing in his ministry, like people were kind of getting it and kind of not. Uh, I, I, think it'll, I think when you get to the first century church, it gets a lot more black and white than even it is in this program, I think. I don't know. I have to think about this one, Rachel. It's a good point. Is the audience here Jews? So, I would if if that's the case, which I think it is, then belief is automatic. I mean, not because they're Jews, but it would be like these are people who are trying to follow the Lord. Yeah. And they realize they've fallen short, and so they want like a, a re a rebirth, a recommitment, a regeneration. Like getting baptized more than once in a Jewish sense wouldn't have been a, that foreign. Like, we're like, you get baptized, one, and done. But in that culture, that wasn't uncommon. That every time you strayed from the Lord, you came back and showed some kind of sign of, yeah, I came back. Yeah, they were familiar with, they had a concept of baptism because of the, there was a bath outside the temple. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I think, too, here, this that last sentence is pretty key. That idea, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with Repentance. So what, what does that sound like? Works. Okay, and in what sense? Well, to bear fruit means you have to do something. Okay. Well, he's specifically talking to the Pharisees. So. And those are the religious leaders of the Jewish faith. He's telling them, 
you need to bear fruit and repent yourself. Does anyone think of like, play. I think of when Jesus told the parable of the guy who had owed the king a great debt and the king forgives him and then he turns around and strangles basically a guy who owes him like very little. I, that's what that makes me think of. Keep bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. So they're asking God to forgive them and they're turning right back around and mm. they're not forgetting their fellow brothers and sisters. Mm. I, that just, that's, so it's not like now you got to go do a good thing because they were already doing the outside, you know, and maybe John's calling out and going, dude, you're just doing this for appearances. You have no intention of actually changing the way you treat each other. Yeah. And that's just, that was my first, like the moment I read that, that all I could think of was Jesus going, you know that guy that got forgiven by the big king and turned around and strangled the other guy for a small debt? Yeah. Yeah, that's your problem. Yeah, and I and you know, I think too the idea is that there is an ongoing like repentance and bearing fruit go hand in hand. Like this is a product. The fruit bearing and then repentance goes with the bearing of fruit. So it, it's as though that there's a um in keeping with this um uh this righteousness uh that that repentance would be the fruit of righteousness. In other words, if you are saved, then what goes along with that is continuing to repent. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, the bearing fruit would be like the result of the repentance, not the means for repentance. Say that one more time. The bearing fruit would be the result of the repentance, not to gain the repentance, or to gain their faith. Well, and I think that um, this verse is telling us that repentance produces... Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Yes, that that's a necessary fruit of righteousness. That... Yeah. I'm clear as a mug right now, aren't I? I'm turning, I'm turning myself around. I'm seeing repentance in this as a byproduct, mm -hmm. like it coming after faith. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think they could always say repentance without that command of believing because there was an understanding that before you could repent, you had to have a faith, right? You had, if you didn't have some faith, there would be no need for repentance because you've got to understand that you're a sinner. And I think, by word, that takes a, an element of faith, right? That you're being called out that there's something amiss in me. This person is saying that there's something amiss in me. I have to believe who that person is saying it. They have to have some kind of authority and I have to be willing to believe that that what they're saying is right and that I need to make a change. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Acts 26.20 First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and then all Judea and to the Gentiles also, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. So what, what does this tell us about repentance? What does it, what does it produce? It produces action. Okay, action. Yeah, a changed a change life. Something different than it was before. Good. So repentance, I think it's these statements summarize it well, a natural outcome of faith, an instrument that brings about salvation, produces a changed life. I think you see all three of those in those verses that we were um, taking a look at now. So then, can someone be saved without repenting? No. Okay. Because you can't, if you believe that what God said is true, that you suck and you missed his <laughs> perfect plan, perfect will, you missed what he calls perfect righteousness, you missed it. If you believe that you missed it, then you have to say, I'm sorry, I missed it. Mm -hmm. I missed the mark, I missed the target, I did not live up to the way you created me to be. So now I accept the blood of Christ. Like, how can you possibly accept God's 
purchasing of you if you haven't understood that you needed to be purchased or that you needed your sins forgiven. Yeah, yeah. The, there has to be some understanding that there's a flaw in you, right? There's something in you about you that needs saving. Okay, good. So can you lose your salvation if you stop repenting? Oh. Ooh. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> what do you think? Can you lose your salvation? Well, that's First John 1, 9, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Is staying saved contingent upon my repentance? That's what you're... That's what I'm asking. What do you think? Your gut's telling you no right now. If you're not exactly sure why, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Good. Mm. <clears throat> so, if no, in other words, if, if someone cannot be saved unless they repent, if the answer is no, then does this mean that people must change their lives before they're saved? No, it's just an acknowledgement of you're dirty. Okay. Just an acknowledgement, okay, that we need, need a Savior. So if people have to change their lives before they're saved, doesn't this mean that salvation is by works? So this would be a challenge to somebody who would say that repentance is necessary for salvation. These things would, because it literally means to change your mind. So the idea would be, do you change your mind before you're saved? Okay. If yes, then what do you do with the scriptures that clearly teach that repentance is necessary for salvation? And how can we believe that someone can be saved without repenting of their sins? Doesn't this produce antinomianism? Somebody tell me, what, does, what is antinomianism? It's actually going to come up in the sermon this Sunday. Is that the third choice by any chance? The third choice? <laughs> so, uh, so antinomianism would be like, well, hey, I'm saved. I mean, I'm under grace. Therefore, I can do whatever I want to do. God's not going to hold my sins against me. That's antinomianism. So that would be a, an absence of repentance. Can someone do that? So you're saying willingly sin. Willingly sin. <laughs> Yeah, Hebrews, is it 10 or 11? It is 10, 26 through 29. Is, yeah, it kind of addresses that issue pretty stoutly. Since, go ahead and read those, if you don't mind. Uh, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fur, uh, fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve, he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? <coughs> Simple, straightforward passage. What reference what was that? Uh, Hebrews 10, 26 to 29. Uh, yeah, that's not an easy one to... Mm -hmm. Has anybody committed a willful sin since they've become a Christian? Certainly. Yeah. I know I have, probably today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, I kind of wish we would... I'm not ready to go into that one, for sure. Because I don't think it believes what we're... I don't think it, it's saying that we lose our salvation. I think it is saying that... I think it's speaking to sanctification. I mean, I think it's speaking to this process that um, sin should be diminishing as an evidence that we've been saved by the blood of Christ. And I've always took this as a person who has heard the gospel, who has accepted Christ, who has 
confessed, and then knowing all that, not just sinning, but a habitual uh, being anti-Christ is the way that I always took this as being uh, an opponent, yeah. not just sinning. But it actually that actually segues into the um, the next conversation that about lordship salvation. Uh, interestingly, and I don't know that I want to try to jump into this. Let's wait on this one. Is anybody familiar with the Lordship versus free grace debate? Are you familiar with this? Um, John MacArthur had espoused a view around 1980 called Lordship Salvation. Uh, that was met with a lot of resistance from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary and some professors there with the idea of free grace. So We'll talk about that next time. What those two mean, why they fought it out, why they're continuing to fight it out. Um, it's an important debate to understand, and it goes to what I think you're talking about. The idea really behind it is, well, how can I keep on sinning and call myself a Christian? Have I really made Jesus Lord of my life if I continue in these habitual willful sins?